Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. So tonight I'd like to talk about grief and sorrow. Something that we uh, all deal with, but recently I encountered a question about that from someone online. It appeared to this questioner that Buddhism ignores grieving. And it got me to thinking about it. I, I discussed it with uh, Jung Sung Prajna. And she pointed out something, she, an insight she observed was that when Ananda died, who was the Buddha's closest confidant in life, the Buddha is said to have shed a single tear. Now, if the scribe meant by that, that the Buddha fell on the floor and tore his hair out wailing in grief, I think he understated it. What do you think the Buddha really felt at that time? Well, the Buddha knew deep sorrow. Anyone who has read the history of his times understands this. He witnessed the slaughter of his entire tribe at the hands of King Vidadaba when he launched the war on Sakya. Now, it's recorded that he tried to convince the king not once, but three times not to attack. And he was unsuccessful and unable to prevent that massacre. I don't know for sure, but to my knowledge, there isn't any record of a single tear. But if we look between the lines of Buddhism and what it teaches us, we can see that grief is a fundamental aspect, not only of life, but of our way. The well-known parable of the mustard seed is often cited as a case in point. The woman known as Kisa Gosami, refused to accept her son's death. And of course, being the mother of a son in those times was also very important in life. But she was so grief stricken that she went around the village looking for someone carrying the body, looking for someone to bring him back to life. Someone advised her to go to the Buddha and the Buddha told her, well, go and seek out a house in which death has never entered, bring me a mustard seed from that house. And in that process, of course, she learned that death is inevitable. She put aside her grief. This is not to say that she did not continue the process of grieving. She buried her son in the forest, returned to the Buddha and became a follower. And not only did she become a follower, but she became a monk of great realization. So on the surface, the parable is a morality tale about the inevitability of loss, but on a deeper, more human level, I think it's consistent with the message that suffering is a gateway to awareness. Had it not been for her grief, she'd never have been referred to the Buddha in the first place. Now, of course, there's also the mustard seed parable in the New Testament, which is interesting in a similar way. Now, although death isn't mentioned there, the mustard seed starts as the smallest of seeds and grows into the largest of the trees until the birds of the air make their nests in its branches. Of course, the growth of the tree is the growth of awareness after death. The, tea, the tree grows out of the decay of the forest floor. Were it not for death, there would be no growth of awareness until the birds of the sky make their nest. 
In other words, you become one with all sentient beings. There are numerous examples of this. I often talk about the Zen ancestor, Kui Nung, who experienced grief as the opening for his awakening. When he lost everything and he came to radical acceptance of it and overheard the verse, let your mind flow free, attaching to nothing. This gave him a great realization. Likewise, Gautama is described as having been a, a very disillusioned um, person acutely affected by human suffering. At the age of 29, which is an age of some budding maturity, he's portrayed as having to confront impermanence and suffering. How deeply did it affect him? Well, deeply enough that it became the core of his practice or his teaching, because the first noble truth is the truth of suffering or dukkha. And of course, the Buddha went on to describe dukkha as the sense of a wheel askew, which he analyzed arises from ignorance of the interconnectedness of all. And of course, we are that skewed wheel feeling out of sync and not quite connected. So we grasp and we grieve at the inevitable loss of inevitable phenomena. So when that happens and impermanence manifests, grief can feel like an unwelcome visitor that's established its own presence. But that is a loss of perspective. As a result, rather than endure the pain of grief, we come up with strategies to counter it. Now that's especially true in the West where we pussyfoot around death quite a bit. And um, I guess there was that scribe who wrote down a single tear line. Now humans have always consoled themselves with the notion of an afterlife, for example. But I think that's a consolation that's a little bare in Buddhism because um, he didn't offer really a promise of a personal afterlife. But he did say something interesting about it. <clears throat> and uh, let me just illustrate by uh, explaining what happened when my wife passed seven years back. Um, we had the uh, three month observance that is traditional um, uh, in the Korean one uh, tradition. And uh, the, the three month vigil, we, every su uh, Sunday we met, the chant that we recited each time exhorted Gina to release her attachments here and move on to the next phase. I was instructed also to let her go and not hold her back. If I loved her, that's what I would do. And I was advised further not even to dream of her. My brother-in-law advised me of that. He's uh, also a one Buddhist. And I didn't. But the message to, Bo to G uh, Gina rather, was in fact for me, the one left behind to grieve. Rather than dwell on loss, I was encouraged to accept it, not deny it, but also not to let it hold me back, just as my love for Gina would not allow me to hold her back. And the Buddha had a term for this, um, this kind of pragmatic logic that was typical of the Buddha. He called it a safe bet. He said, act as though your karma carried over into the afterlife. That way you'll create good karma no matter what. So the reality is whether or not there is an afterlife, the logical desire of love would be for me to accept that person's path and to release them, accept and bear the loss. It hurts now, but there is a new path ahead. Spiritual bypassing uh, by uh, 
trying to manage our grief, whether uh, ignoring it, suppressing it, restraining it, and all that stuff will get us emotionally stuck. Uh, as a result, we might turn to addictive behaviors to, to escape, or we might um, uh, rush into poor relationships uh, to fill a void. Um, yeah, we might do, might engage in thoughtless activity just to escape. So um, the other thing that happens too is we could get into, get stuck into one of the stages of grief that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and David Kessler uh, defined. Denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. And depression can be an unwelcome visitor that overstays its welcome. But the fifth stage is acceptance. Now, what does it take to accept loss? Well, there's no easy answer, of course, otherwise uh, I wouldn't even be talking here. It isn't easy to accept our grief, but that's why when we do come to radical acceptance of it, it is such a powerful and significant breakthrough in our lives. We know how suffering spurred the practice of the Buddha. So when we think about it, Instead of thinking of the many attachments that we face as impediments, we can also recognize them as fortuitous doors to awakening. So lastly, I wanna ask if, I wanna investigate whether there are any Buddhist practices that can help us uh, to integrate grief into a healthy, uh, open-hearted type of life. Of course, letting go of attachment is the way, but it is gradual. Deliberate mindfulness of grief is one way to help ease into the next phase. Someone suggested that grief could be considered a Brahma Vihara. A Brahma Vihara, of course, you recognize that as the, the four great virtues of Buddhism, love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. So we cultivate these virtues as a basis for practice. And we do it because these challenges arise in life. There's always going to be suffer, uh, suffering out there that will help us to cultivate uh, compassion. And why is it important to generate and arouse compassion? Well, first it brings us into the oneness of all beings. It connects us. And it becomes the condition for compassionate action. And likewise, there will always be loss to arouse grief. Now, if compassion is how love manifests when we see other beings suffer, what if we regard grief as compassion for ourselves when we see ourselves suffer? Our ability to grieve is a measure of our open-heartedness and freedom from self-obsession, where it can be a pathway to that. It can open us to inner explorations. We can look into what it is to cling. It can humanize us in sensitizing us to the pain and suffering of others and connect us to all beings. But feeling grief isn't wallowing. I don't want to give that impression, nor is it just shoving it aside. Those are reactions. Instead, as Buddhists, we practice samadhi, not as an escape, but where we can see things in perspective. We come to see that without loss, and the passing of all compounded things, there's no room for birth. Unless we learn to let go, we can't move on. So I'll leave you with this thought. With every breath, the old moment is lost and the new moment arrives. Thank you. <laughs>